We're rolling now. Um, awesome job, Derek, wherever you are. Crushing it always for us. <clears throat> the next presenter, presenters that we have are, as you see, are Alex Oliver and Danny Foley. And Alex has been a speaker for us twice, and if you were here for Alex's presentation, I don't need to tell you anymore. Uh, you were here, you've experienced it. A um, couple things. So Alex is the owner of Virginia High Performance. Danny's one of uh, the head trainers there, and they, they train, they've trained athletes, but what they really specialize in training um, active and former military. Um, Alex had a, thank you. They've been known um, in, the, in the circles of, of those special operations communities that most of us just hear about. I know a number of you in this room are in that community. And we all know that community doesn't talk a lot because they do their job. And um, Virginia High Performance has been on the cutting edge of that performance um, continuum there and pulling things together. And a lot of it is based upon some of Alex's experiences when he was in the SEAL teams uh, for a couple decades. So what we're going to do, he's going to pull the curtain back a little bit. And he, he told me that this is something he was looking to do, uh, share the special sauce a little bit. So I'm super pumped to hear it uh, because a lot of the stuff that they're doing uh, has launched many ships in the training and recovery world as, as well as uh, has helped a whole lot of people out there that fight for our freedom every day. Um, one caveat, when Alex, and raise your hand, Alex, so they know which one you are. <laughs> when Alex is speaking, we would ask that you put your phones down, and this is what we call blackout hour with Alex, specifically, because to give a little bit of context to some of uh, what he's going to talk about is something that we don't need on the internet. And if we can't be adults and understand the respect of that, then... No problem, just you need to remove yourself from the room for the next hour. Um, having him and Danny here with us is an absolute pleasure and it's an honor, and I wanna make sure that we honor their wishes in that also. So, without further ado, Alex Oliver. Thanks, Bert. Uh, appreciate having the honor to uh, be here for a third time. And uh, like you said, when we talked, uh, it's time to pull the curtain back a little bit. So even though I've never let any of the other two uh, talks I've done be recorded, I did tell Bert, hey, after this, we'll go through it, we'll scrub it, make sure I'm not saying anything that can uh, bring any bad light on the community I used to work with or maybe some of the, someone's name might come up that I didn't mean to release. So we'll scrub it. If it's good, I'll let Sorenex go ahead and put it out. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Uh, thanks again, Bert. Pops, thank you. 41 years ago, planting that seed of strength. And now those roots are so damn strong and embedded in the hard rock and bedrock, this damn thing ain't never going to die. Thank you. <clears throat> so pulling the curtain back on what VHP does. <clears throat> like Bert said, it's about putting these veterans and some of these active duty guys still on the battlefield, putting them back together, giving them back pieces of their life uh, that have been taken, lost, however you want to look at it. <clears throat> In order to do that, I have to go back to 2008 on deployment. Uh, me and a couple of other guys finished working out, and we're like, you know, what would it take just to make our guys here 2 or 3% better? And that was a seed that got planted. Uh, we got back from that deployment and everybody was getting ready to go on leave, and they said, hey, not, not you three guys. You guys wrote this damn thing up, and now it's gonna be something. And so we got a big, huge budget uh, in the eight figures region, 
and said, hey, go figure this human performance thing out. So <clears throat> scattered that to the, to the four winds, uh, sending guys all over the world looking for the best of what we thought performance was. And initially, of course, we were looking at the physical side, but the biggest thing that I say that I did when I was active duty, what I got paid to do wasn't to go out and, and shoot people, kill people, or whatever. It was to go out and solve problems. So we, need, we knew we needed a cognitive piece to this human performance program. And the third pillar that we started off on was the fueling system. So physical, cognitive, and fuel. <clears throat> Starting to bring in these professionals and helping us design this thing, we started getting some pretty good traction. We got some notice from some scientists and really helped, start, helped us to start break this thing down and open it up. Very, very smart scientists. And <clears throat> the things we were doing at first, of course, you're spinning your wheels trying to figure this thing out. <clears throat> But as we started getting smarter, we started adding the things that needed to be in there, then the results started coming back from some of the early studies. Um, I think we were about two, two plus years in, and one of the first ones came back and they said, hey, uh, you guys did it, right? Two, three percent across the board. So running, swimming, weightlifting, cognitive, problem solving faster, whatever these things were, blood, uh, <clears throat> Two to three percent, that's what was showing up. But what came in out of that too was they said, uh, you guys are dropping the non-catastrophic injury rate at this place by almost 30%. So outside of a guy getting shot or blown up, those day-to-day -day injuries that happened in that lifestyle uh, were becoming less. Less guys were having surgeries, less guys were having to take longer breaks for chronic pain and other issues. <clears throat> so that solidified it. Um, all the teams, units, everybody under SOCOM eventually came up and uh, started a program called the Preservation of the Force and Family that was birthed out of some of what we were doing. So proud that that is happening. Now that's like a $500 million program. <clears throat> so I worked as a collateral duty, uh, I think probably for the next three or four years on that. And then ended up getting custody of my daughter, so that was pretty much the end of my operational career. And then I went down and worked in that department full time. <clears throat> so again, being embedded into that, speaking with scientists, speaking with all these professionals in the uh, performance world, uh, I was learning a lot. At the same time, I was trying to share what was going on within my community of all these different kinds of injuries that we were dealing with. <clears throat> 2015. I'm med retired, I'm out, career's over, what am I going to do next? <clears throat> Had a bunch of different options, most of which would probably take me back overseas, and I, do, I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, so I said, well, hey, I've been learning a lot about this HP stuff, let's go see if uh, we can do it on the outside. So, opened up VHP. <clears throat> And at first, we just started off with kids, youth athletics, whole team, training all those uh, kids, boys and girls, sports teams. And that was fun. It was rewarding. But I knew I wanted something more. And however that came to be, a couple different nonprofits in 2016 came to us and said, hey, uh, kind of know about some things that you're doing. Would you be able to build a program for recovering veterans that we're trying to help? I said, yeah, I think I got a little bit of uh, knowledge on that. <clears throat> so we set out, designed a four-week program, looking at everything from obviously the physical, but bringing in a cognitive piece, certified brain injury specialist, speech language pathologist, specific for, mem for memory and cognition, uh, primarily related to TBI, whether that be from impact or blast. So now we're looking at the blood, we're doing DEXA scans on everybody, She's doing all the meal planning, chef cooking all the meals, the cognitive piece, doing behavioral tests, building life patterns for these guys to keep using from day to day and get better at these things. <clears throat> Chiropractor, using alignment to, to put the body back together because we're just 
kind of twisted around from all the things that we've done. Massage therapies, deep tissue, myofascial release, <clears throat> sensory deprivation, whatever we were thinking could help, we were trying it out. Working on this, if I rewind back to uh, my time in the military a little bit, as we started growing the program and adding more things in, we accidentally stumbled on this sleep thing. <clears throat> Little positive hits in there. We tried focusing on it and just couldn't crack the code as, as well as uh, I would have liked. Average guys were sleeping about four hours a night. Didn't matter if they were home, didn't matter if they were deployed, didn't matter if they're on a road trip somewhere here in the States. <clears throat> me being one of those guys. For me, at that point, I think it was probably about 10 years I'd been living that lifestyle. Ambien was a big part of my life. Pain meds, which I'll get into a little bit later. <clears throat> um, so VHP, putting all these things together now, some of which we weren't working on when I was still active duty, but adding them in as we were starting to get more knowledge and seeing more results for the folks that we were helping out. <clears throat> so four weeks of that, individualized programming. Everybody on the team at VHP is focused solely on the individual. We're not grouping folks together because you, you just can't fix a group of people with so many different kinds of injuries. And injuries that most people, I think, in the performance world don't see. And Danny will get into a little bit of that. <clears throat> so. What we're seeing now within VHP is, I would say, a bigger performance increase across the board than what, what I was a part of when I was still active duty. <clears throat> Danny's going to get into a little bit more of that. And this is really just a peek through the keyhole, right? I could speak to each one of the modalities that we have working at VHP for an hour easily, right, to go in. But to hit the wave tops, pull the curtain back, give you guys a peek through the, key, through the keyhole. <clears throat> no further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Danny Foley, the head strength coach at Virginia High Performance. He was the first coach that we hired, and uh, last year we made a leadership change within VHP, and I could not believe how fast Danny ramped the team up. It was mind-blowing and a little bit to me because I was like, I had no idea how hungry that whole team was and what they were capable of. And when he pulled that curtain back on me, it surprised me. I can't thank him en enough. And uh, we'll let Danny do his piece for you now. And I'll come back at the end. When I showed up at Virginia High Performance about five years ago, I arrived under the impression that I was a strength coach. <clears throat> Had you asked me a couple years back, I would have told you that I'm a strength coach who works with a predominantly injured population, and so by default, I tend to do a lot of physical therapy and rehab work. But today, the best way that I can describe what we do at Virginia High Performance is we solve problems. We are complex problem solvers with an acumen for human movement, development, and performance. And no matter who walks through our doors on Monday morning, irrespective of what they bring with them or where they're trying to go, we will find the solution by any means necessary because we will not reconcile with shortcoming. <clears throat> As I mentioned when I showed up, I was under the impression that I was going to be working with athletes. I didn't know anything about this military or tactical realm. Had never even crossed my mind. I damn sure didn't know anything about injury management or restoration. This was confounding for me at the time. This wasn't what I signed up for. I had no intention of this. And boy, did I have absolutely no idea what I had just signed up for. <clears throat> Over the years, as Alex alluded to, we've gone through several evolutions and progressions through BHP. But being somewhat blindsided by this prompted me with a decision. 
And to be perfectly candid with you, had I known descriptively what this job was going to entail, I probably would have walked away. Thankfully, at the time, I was very low on the totem pole, so I didn't get a lot of input. As it was instructed to me, we were going to be working with athletes twice a day, five days a week. We were standing up the Continue Mission program at Virginia High Performance, and we were going to be working predominantly with Special Operations Command personnel. Outside of that, it was left to my imagination. So I go to Alex's office one day, probably looking timid and frantic and perhaps even unfit for the job at the time. I'm seeking input. I need direction, something tangible, the X's and O's to what I'm supposed to do with my athletes. This was so new to me. Alex, as his typical self, very cool, calm, and collected, just kind of sits back in his chair, kicks his foot up over his knee. Pretty sure there was a pistol on his desk, but that's neither here nor there. And he says, you got a left and a right flank. Over here on the left, you have to establish trust with the athletes that you're working with. This is a community that is developed and built around trust, and if we do not have that, preferably by day one, then we don't have anything. Over here on the right, nobody gets hurt on our time. However you go about your training, that's fine. Nobody gets injured on our floor. On top of that, in between the two flanks, you got to know your foundational sciences, understand the why behind the applications of what you're doing. Anything else? Just go figure it out. I could not have been more dismayed with that conversation. <laughs> Had I known <clears throat> now, back then, I would have gotten it. But I didn't get it at the time. I wanted direction. He's given me these wide-ass boundaries with ambiguous instruction. But ultimately, that would end up being the best thing that could have happened, not only for me personally on a professional scale, but also, I believe, for the business as a whole as well. Because it never gave us time for preconceived notion. It never gave me the chance to go home and watch a bunch of Netflix documentaries to try to assimilate the culture, be the person that I thought they would have wanted me to be in that moment. It never gave me a chance to go scroll Instagram and Twitter and try to find the most intense tactical training workouts. Everything about this program, from its inception, has been authentic and organic in its development. <clears throat> when we hear the word tactical, we often connotate it to a few select things. Among those, we think that everything is about intensity, going hard, always finding failure. Pain is just weakness leaving the body. Fuck that knee pain, get deeper in your squat. We envision an environment that is led by the gospel of five-finger death punch and let the bodies hit the floor. <clears throat> but I can tell you that those are the furthest things from the truth or what this community is seeking. Contrarily, what these individuals are in search for is a true subject matter expert. And again, as Alex alluded to, this is a very tight-knit community. They don't seek external input for very much very often, albeit training endeavors or otherwise. Because of this, we have to put professionalism as a priority. We have to be punctual. We have to follow through when we say we're going to do something. We have to be intelligent, being able to provide an answer when a question is asked. Fluent, being able to call an audible when things didn't go the way that we expected them to without having disruption to the training flow. We need to be very precise, calculated, and measured in the applications that we're choosing, doing things with intent and meeting them with a mutual reciprocity of investment. They need to see that it matters to us as much as it matters to them. Perhaps most importantly, this requires an exceptional ability to communicate. 
irrespective of where you ride, you have to be able to come up or come down with the person that you're working with. And despite this community being so small, it's insane how wide the spectrum of personalities is. And you have to be fluent with this. <clears throat> You know, right here in this room this afternoon, we have hundreds of some of the best strength and conditioning and human performance coaches in the entire world, many of whom who I've looked up to and modeled my work after for several years. And to this audience specifically, I'd like to pose you all a question today. That question is, how would you? How would you get somebody to sprint who has less than 20% of their functional glute muscles. We'll call this athlete Jay. Jay came to us a few years after being medevaced out of a firefight in which he was shot five times. Two of those AK-47 rounds penetrated through the pelvis. He would go on to have over 30 surgeries, spend upwards of 18 months bouncing back and forth between the hospital, treating infections and setbacks, and then clinical rehab, relearning how to walk and perform daily activities. When Jay showed up to us, he fully was intent on remaining operational. How would you all populate 10 hours of training time a week for an individual who was literally just told that they may only have two to four weeks left to live. We'll call him Strauss. <sighs> Strauss came to us in his 17th year battling Hodgkin's lymphoma. When I first met Strauss, I walked into the lobby, and he was slumped over on the couch, borderline incapacitated, breathing tubes coming out of his nostrils, attached to an oxygen tank down by his feet, sitting in a raggedy gray backpack. Strauss looked horrific. And we were expected to train twice a day for the next month. How would you all add 17 pounds of lean mass for an individual who's in the peak of their physical career? We'll call him Todd. Todd was a former Division I football player who came to us after a handful of minor surgeries and injuries, but really just looking to add strength and mass to be more durable down the back half of his career. How would you all help prepare someone for one of the most rigorous and physically demanding selections of any military branch in any country when they're coming off of their fourth slap tear? We'll call him Dan. Dan came to us about 16 weeks post-op from that last slap tear, <clears throat> and he was about nine months out from this selection process. And at the time, he couldn't even get his hand over his shoulder. But he's going to be expected to do 90 push-ups at minimum in two minutes, plus max effort pull-ups with a minimum standard of 20, among many other things. How would you all get someone to ride a bike when they came to you four weeks earlier using a cane and two external fixators on their legs to walk? We'll call him Hank. Hank came to us a number of years after a nearly fatal bike accident left him with a fractured C5, C6. He's partially paralyzed. He would spend six months in a coma. He, too, having to relearn how to walk and perform daily activities. And when he showed up to us, he fully intended on getting back on that bike. <clears throat> there is a tremendous spectrum to the work that we do. And in a lot of cases, this comes with an equal amount of complexity. At times, this requires patience and delicacy, while at other, it commands fortitude and action. As with anything else, the virtue of problem solving will not materialize without barriers. But over the years, through our work, we have developed a refined set of acquired skills that permit us the ability 
to navigate these proverbial barriers. The spectrum of athletes and injuries that we see on a daily basis commit us to our intuition as we must be able to traverse the gray areas of human performance. When you walk into a conventional strength and conditioning or physical therapy clinic, <clears throat> things are very neat and orderly. Most of the athletes coming in have about the same abilities, and for the most part, there's a common goal or theme that each of them are working towards. This allows the practitioners to kind of neatly lay their keys across their desk, being able to pick up and go open the doors to known solutions at their leisure. And this isn't to undermine or belittle anybody's work by any stretch of the means. In fact, I envy you all, sometimes. But with this, we simply don't have that luxury. When the solutions are much more ambiguous and the keys are much fewer and far between, it's simply on us to be able to engineer the outcome. And as we like to say, fuck the problem, find the solution. The first step in all of this is having a deliberate and concerted effort to thoroughly understand the individuals that you're working with. This is a topic that gets discussed frequently, but what I'm talking about is getting beyond the superficial layers. We need to understand who they are as a person, not just know what they do for a living. We need to understand how they got to where they are now, and beyond just what their medical chart reads. Equally, we need to understand where they're trying to go, and not just the physical qualities that may be needed to get there. We need to understand what drives them, not just what plagues them. Because the better that we can understand, the more precise we can be. And as our precision improves, our efficiency will go up. And when you're working in a time cap space like, like we are, as in four weeks, efficiency is non-negotiable. <clears throat> I'm a civilian. I've never spent any time in the military. And as I mentioned, this was a little bit disconcerting for me at the, at the beginning. But what I've recognized over the last year, couple of years, is that this is a community that has a severely distorted perspective of training over time. Think about it. Think about what they're exposed to the demands that they're placed under, the extremes that they'll push themselves to, the no-fail attitude and mindset. After so many years of being physically abused, it's kind of tough to get jacked up about bench press or back squat. When you need two hours in the morning to get your back going, training does not resonate the same way that it used to. One of the preliminary points of emphasis for us with every athlete that we see is identifying and repairing their relationship with training. These are individuals, in a lot of cases, that come to us believing that they are compromised. They're not what they used to be. They can't do what they used to do. They've gone from alpha to average. And if they can't do X, Y, Z, then what the hell's the point of it? Our job in these cases is to show them a different route, show them that they can do things that go beyond pounding the pavement and maxing out on bench. Other athletes come to us after perpetual iterations of failure. They are mentally exhausted. For these individuals, our job is to recalibrate the expectation and the goal. Sure, you may not be able to do what you did 20 years ago, but you're not trying to go where you once were. There's a different way. We can figure it out. Other athletes have been treated as if they're broken, brittle, fragile. They've been wrapped up in bubble wrap, stuffed into a corner, thrown a mini band, 
Go finish your clamshells. Come get me when you're done. For these individuals, we have to show them, not tell them, but show them they're not broken. Tim Kelly, stand up for me real quick. <clears throat> Tim has done some of the most incredible work that I've ever seen in my life, strength and conditioning or otherwise, but Tim was the assigned coach for Jay, and I went up to Tim <clears throat> one day when they were setting up some cones and some boxes, and Tim was kind of off to the side, and what did I say to you? I said, hey man, we gotta get a little bit closer. The, the perspective of this doesn't look good, man. He's hobbling all over the place. Tim very casually just turned to me and he said, I want him to know that he can do it. This is an individual who wasn't walking six weeks ago, and this dude's got him doing hurdles and box jumps and everything under the sun, unsupervised, mostly. It's important that we repair the relationship. They don't know what they don't know, and that is largely our job. <clears throat> Just as we need to change the perspective of training and ability for the athletes, we too, as coaches, must modify what we perceive to be movement. This is an industry that has become overtly infatuated with good, bad, right, wrong, and in a lot of cases, doing so without even having context. What we emphasize in lieu of this is movement signatures and solutions. Simply, we are seeing the movement for what it is, for where they are now, and then trying to identify ways that we can positively influence this athlete in the right direction. No more and no less. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, rather than indict them and remind them of everything that's wrong with them and treating them as if they're broken, is we are trying to widen their spectrum. We want them to be able to move through new ranges, planes and vectors of movement in an effort to hopefully raise the entire system. A lot of the times this doesn't take much, but if we can't properly identify and interpret what we're seeing, then we'll never be able to have the right application or method. <clears throat> With such a wide spectrum of individuals, <clears throat> it was incumbent on us to stand up some sort of foundational construct. So over the last couple of years, the team and I have been collaboratively just refining and retooling our model that we work from. One of the first things that we established was a tiering or classification system, very simple. So we look at our athletes as either red, blue, or green. Our red group represents our restorative population. Quite honestly, this looks more like occupational or physical therapy in some cases than it does strength and conditioning. With this population, we just need to give something back give one thing back, basic function, being able to put their shoe on without looking or feeling like a jackass trying to do it, being able to get in and out of their car without getting back pain. We need to restore hope. We need to show them that there is a way, providing companionship for them. Our blue group, this mostly represents our transitioning athletes individuals that are coming to the tail end of a 20 or 30 year illustrious career, and everything in their world is changing. They've been under insurmountable stress, sleep deprivation, poor nutrition, everything hurts. For these individuals, we need to be the ignition, showing them that there are different ways to do similar things, but really just getting them back to equilibrium. Our green athletes, these represent our pseudo NFL or professional sport athletes. Extremely elite physical com competitors or performers in their own right. With these individuals, a lot of the times, we just need to show them one or two things and then just kind of 
not get in the way. Let athletes be athletes. <clears throat> On a semi-tangible scale, we work from what we call restorative strength training. And the overarching premise of restorative strength training is simply identifying the weak link in the chain. There's nothing spectacular up here. Everyone in this room is very well familiar with all of the terms that are up there. I believe if there's anything that we do somewhat differently, it's just simply the way in which we approach it and where we emphasize our time. Because remember, we only have four weeks. Efficiency is key. So what we do throughout the course of the first week, which we consider to be an extended evaluation period, is we simply observe and analyze what's most needed, what's the most pressing need for this individual. You cannot have any pre-cut agenda. There can be no preconceived notions. Let the athletes show you what they need. No matter what the circumstances or extremes may be, they'll give you the answers. From there, we simply reverse engineer backwards and just try to provide the best things that we can in the time we have to help keep them going. At the start of this, I mentioned misconceptions with the tactical realm. And this is why this is so critical. Had I gotten the opportunity beforehand, when I got hired at BHP, to go do a bunch of homework and research, I would have been wrong. I would have been wrong on everything, but especially on the training end. We have to know when to be a scalpel and when to be a machete. Injury restoration is not something that you just come in with a broad stroke machete swing. It's very clinical, it's procedural. With others, if we go the procedural route or the scalpel route, we'll lose their interest. They just want to go do things. Okay. The versatility is key, but the chronological sequencing in which you're applying your methods is again the underpinning to it all. <clears throat> While the training piece is a little bit more tailored and individualized, the recovery model is much more ubiquitous. Bear in mind that for a lot of these individuals, especially the elder ones, recovery is like counterculture. It's just not a part of their language. So for a lot of these individuals, this is a brand new world. But our goal with this is very simple. We need to make things comprehensive, convenient, and consistent. This is the piece that we can give to them. Whether they're over in whatever country or they're doing whatever training out in middle America, doesn't matter, you can take this with you and you can utilize this to help keep you where you're trying to go. It's our chance to develop some autonomy for them. The components to the recovery are very simple. We have daily things that we need to do, we have weekly modalities, and then we have at-home or homework care each of those having a different purpose. The daily is our way of kind of using it as checks and balances. The readiness scores, what the omega wave is reading, how that's gonna determine our movement prep, what we're gonna do for our cool down or post training, those things all fluctuate naturally, that's easy. The weekly modalities are really where we get our money's worth. These are things that again, a lot of these athletes have never been introduced to. Sensory deprivation float tanks, Normatex, deep tissue massage. What they finally recognize towards the tail end of the program is there's no way that they can train with the intensity that they need or want to without having a robust recovery wheel, and it must be integrated. Recovery is not effective when it's retroactive. It must be a part of the plan. Collectively, between these two, the training and the recovery piece, what we're looking to do is elevate their floor. Again, bear in mind the general personality of these individuals. Everything is through the roof at all times. If somebody sees somebody else doing more on back squat or bench press, best believe they're going to ask you if they can do 10 pounds more. We've seen that several times, right? But our goal is to improve the physical qualities that are needed 
to give them a better platform to stand on, to go do what they do. Again, referencing back to misconceptions, absolutely nothing about our training is designed to replicate the intensities or the styles of training that they do at work. I can assure you, there is no conceivable way that you can do in a training facility what they do on their time. Don't even try to mimic it. It's not in our interest. What we want to do is come in and fill the physical qualities that they need to be able to go do what they do, no more and no less. By trying to raise the floor, what we are effectively doing is reducing the amount of margin between what's weak and what's strong. What this does, we believe, is collectively mitigate injury vulnerability. So for a, a, a population that is so riddled by injury, sometimes the best thing we can do is just make it so they're a little bit less injury prone. And that's it. They're great at what they do. <clears throat> at the end of the day, <clears throat> we don't really see this as these individuals coming to our program as much as us getting to be a part of their journey. And albeit brief, what we're most interested in is simply identifying what we can do to help them. It is the least that we can do for this population to do everything that we can. This job has been an absolute privilege. And I told you I had no idea what I was in for when I signed up. I had no idea what these individuals are exposed to, the demands that are placed on them, the sacrifices that they and their families make for decades, their unrelenting pursuit and commitment to greatness and getting better by any means necessary. It has been an unbelievably humbling experience for me. I can't thank these individuals enough for what they do. And I certainly can't thank you enough for everything that you've done. This job has changed my life, and I've been introduced to some of the most compelling, interesting, and accomplished human beings that I've ever met in my entire life. I wouldn't trade this for anything. <clears throat> in a world that is so driven by data and numbers, PRs, shaving tens of seconds off of 40s. It's not really what we're interested in. At least it's not where it's felt. Our impact is measured by things like this. By far the most holistic and effective approach to recovery I've ever seen. A truly life-changing four weeks. Opportunities to heal, strengthen, be better family members, friends, teammates. Transition from driving a vehicle modified with hand controls back to my own truck. Unique techniques that Tim brought to the table provided things that I hadn't even seen in 15 months. I made more progress in six weeks than I did in six months. Putting pounds on a deadlift, shaving tents off of a 40 dash, increasing vertical jump, those things are just byproducts of sweat equity. The results are going to happen. Don't aim for results. Make an impact. Eyes up. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep yeah. going, keep going. And I think distance, distance, distance. Same, same cadence, same cadence. Give it a rest. This is how we were able to get Jay not only sprinting, but bounding, running, climbing, back to a PRT. 
He passed that PRT, giving him back discretion over his own career. Everybody had written this dude off. Now he's back in control. This clip here, although short, three months ago, give or take, he's progressed every single week since he's been with us. I shit you not, he's, in, he's improved every single week. It's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Jay has discretion again. That's how we were able to populate 10 hours of training time <clears throat> for Strauss. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Strauss passed away August 6, 2020. <clears throat> but we were able to, if nothing else, extend the quality of his life. We were able to raise his saturated O2 levels from 88% to 96, which was the number that was needed for him to qualify for an experimental trial down at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm gonna miss that man. But I'll say this much. I never knew that anybody who needed an O2 tank could talk so goddamn much. <laughs> That's how we were able to add 17 pounds of lean muscle for Todd, <clears throat> who again came to us at a very high level. An interesting note with Todd, is he spent no less than 45 minutes a day in recovery boots, Normatec recovery boots. And on most days, he actually napped between training sessions. <clears throat> That's how we were able to help get Dan to and through one of the most rigorous selection processes in the entire world. Four weeks earlier, he couldn't raise his hand above his shoulder. Dan got there. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. Oh, my God. <sighs> it's a little nerve-wracking. And that's how we were able to get Hank back on the bike when he couldn't walk on his own four weeks earlier. On the last day of Hank's program, he brought in that same bike that he wrecked and broke his neck on. He took it outside and had all of us follow along and he rode that motherfucker around our compound, <laughs> standing up. It's pretty, pretty incredible uh, what this team does. Um, they're phenomenal. <clears throat> Back to Jay. Um, those kinds of injuries, I say, where it's, uh, you know, none of my coaches had ever seen that kind of stuff before, right? And then having to figure out in that short amount of time, Jay's was six weeks long, 
But how are we going to put this guy together? How are we going to give, I'll say a kid, right, who is just reaching his prime, I'd say, extremely able that was now not capable, right? I would say behind the scenes, the decisions were already made for him, right? 15 months and arguably the best rehab people that were in the military working on him after 37 surgeries. I think it was 88% of his glutes were gone. Pass the PRT, physical readiness test for you guys that don't understand, but it's a run, it's an ocean swim, push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups. So imagine having only 12% of your glutes and having to run however long the, 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 the mile and a half or three miles is uh, at about a 7.30 pace with only 12% of your glutes. Doing a 1,000 meter ocean swim with fins with only 12% of your glutes. <clears throat> Passed the test, crushed it. What I like to say VHP does for most of these folks in some capacity is a return of capability. That peace that's taken from them. The capability gives them opportunity. Jay, out of what he got with us, got the opportunity to make the decision on whether he wants to stay in, keep fighting, or if he wants to go out and pursue other things. Six weeks before, we came to, before he came to us, he didn't have that. A return of capability, which led to opportunity. <clears throat> there were some other things I was going to go into, and then my good buddy, Coach Ivy, sends me a message a couple days ago. He's like, basically, I'm getting my mind right. And then I see him last night, and he's like, you're going to bring it again. I was like, no, I'm just going to talk about some VHP stuff. He's like, no, you're going to bring it. (laughs) Shit. (laughs) Now i got to bring it. So a couple of the things that we've been working on and and, and developing at, at VHP recently uh, has been something that we're calling emotional regulation. <clears throat> There's a lot to that that guys struggle with emotionally when you think about chronic pain for decades, sleep deprivation, not being able to remember things, uh, anger management, <clears throat> Guys that are supposed to be high capacity thinkers and now you, you can't remember somebody's name you just met at a party, you know, and you're sitting there and you're still talking to them. These frustrations turn into all kinds of things. <clears throat> um, for me, I kind of referred to them as my, my demons. With pain, with sleep, with anger, these things were sucking me down into this rabbit hole and I didn't know how to get out. <clears throat> Alcohol was a big piece of that. It's a big piece of the, um, the community. But everything started affecting my personal life. I could still do all these things because I always had put work first back then. <clears throat> and some of that also comes with the culture. So going through BUDS, or if you're in soft at all, uh, whatever the selection is, in my opinion, right, and and I have to say this, I believe it's needed. When we go through that process every day, you're hearing the same stuff. Hey, suck it up, eat the pain. Don't show weakness, don't cry, keep grinding it out no matter what. Most of these guys going through these kinds of training are teenagers, still developing into adulthood. They say the, the, the mental side, emotional side of, of humans doesn't mature until we're about 24 or 25. 
So still children growing. And in order to do this job and be successful on the battlefield, like I said, I believe these things have to happen, right? We gotta turn some of these emotions off because they don't serve us on the battlefield, right? Sadness, weakness, empathy, crying. There's no time for that. When the bullets are flying and the guy next to you goes down, gets half his face shot off, you got no time to rely on natural human nature and go, I want to help my friend. You got to win that battle. So like I said, those emotions, those feelings don't serve us. Best way to do it is turn it off. Go through 21 years of that. Let me rewind. <clears throat> the guys that make it at the end were guys that were either able, in my opinion, to control that switch or it was just turned off for them. Those are the guys that are left standing at the end of selections. <clears throat> Going through buds, you graduate. My class, I think we started prep with 173 guys, classed up with 124, I think, graduated with 16 originals. Finish that, and you're just excited. You're waiting for that bullet train to come by and pick you up and take you off on your career. Graduation day, you're standing on that podium at the station, this metaphorical station at the train station, and that bullet train whips by, and you jump on. <clears throat> and the way I look at it is you never get a seat on the train. You're just holding on to the outside. And that thing's hurtling through space 200 miles an hour for however long you do that career. <clears throat> and at some point, it hits you when your time's coming to an end, whether that may be, hey, it's, it's 20 years or whatever, or injuries have added up, but one way or another, you're coming off that train. Whether you let go on your own or somebody's stomping on your fingers until you fall off. And you sit there and you think to yourself in that last minute before you come off, this damn thing has never stopped one time since I've been on it. You come off that thing, you hit the dirt and you roll. And by the time you get up, you get your wits about you, that thing's out of sight. And you dust yourself off and you look left and you look right. And you go, which way's the station? You've had this huge support network of brotherhood and other support people that make that machine happen, doing everything for you outside of cleaning your guns and doing the actual training. Everything else is pretty much done for you. Amazing support network, and that needs to be that way too. So you've just lost your support network. You don't know which way the station is. You've got two ways to go. Some guys get lucky and pick the short way and make it back quickly. Some guys don't get so lucky and they pick the, wrong, the long way. That's a hard, hard journey. I was on it. And obviously, we all know, some guys never make it back to the station. I was almost one of those guys. But I made it out of the rabbit hole. <clears throat> so when I think about me and what I wanted BHP to be, <clears throat> outside of this kind of healing, kind of an underwritten thing was going to be uh, a different kind of healing, you know, this emotional piece and helping guys get control of this, help them understand it because I didn't understand it. I'm still trying to understand it. I've got myself in a pretty good place, but a lot of them aren't. 
uh, 22 a day that we hear about, it's not the correct number. Much higher. 65% of that 22 a day are Vietnam era guys. In our country right now, is what, four months out from 20 years of sustained combat. Never been done before in our nation's history. Average number of deployments in Vietnam was two. Ten year war. For 20 years, and some of my teammates that are still doing it from when the war started are getting ready to go, I think here, 21 or 22 deployments. Think about that. Think about the 22 a day and that number. What are we going to have 10, 15 years from now? And I don't think the nation or anybody else is prepared for what's going to come down the pipe when this, when this war's veterans really start having issues down the road. So we're trying to get ahead of it. <clears throat> like I said, most of these guys, they get off that that bullet train <clears throat> in many of those years, especially when you start getting close to the end of your time and you're not being used as much, so to speak, you got these badass samurai swords, maybe the last year or even after you're out, it's just been getting dragged through the sand. VHP is trying to put a polish back on that, put an edge back on it. Let them know how valuable they were and how valuable they still are. <clears throat> Continue mission program was almost called something else. Almost called it no fail mission. <clears throat> and just before these nonprofits came to me and asked me to create a program for the veterans and later was able to do it for the active duty side as well. <clears throat> Had an old teammate of mine who was out, been out for a while. I knew he'd been struggling. One night I get up in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom, get back to the bed, I check my phone. I got a missed call from him. Left a message, a couple text messages. And what I read scared the shit out of me. Because he was getting ready to do some bad shit. <clears throat> I hadn't missed him by much time, and I was like, I have an opportunity right now. Maybe, maybe he's listening. So, right there outside my bed, I texted him something. <clears throat> hoping he'd read it. Not go through with what he was going to do. <clears throat> I was still kind of getting through my own demons at the time. I won't read what he had sent me, but I'll read what I sent him. <clears throat> it's an ebb and flow, buddy. I graze insanity with my fingertips from time to time. It's an endless struggle to come back to the sane side. Our penance, I think, for doing the things that we've done, which I would not trade for the world. To be honest, I like the struggle, the fight, but that's probably because I continue to win it. We have to. It's who we are. No failed mission. probably one of the scariest nights of my life. Lots of calls, no answers. Finally got a text in the morning, late morning, just said thank you. And even still in his struggle, it was a couple days before we were able to get to talk. But it was just one simple thing like that, being able to respond. And he's like, in my, in my moment, that darkest hour, 
He goes, that text message saved my life and brought me back. The struggles are still there, but it's things like this that anybody, any one of us can do. Everybody in here knows a veteran. Maybe they're struggling, maybe they're not. <clears throat> but as I talk about giving opportunity to Jay, giving opportunity to all these other folks, <clears throat> it's in us all, right? Something you say can save one of these guys. That's what VHP is doing in a nutshell. Thank you, Bert, for giving me this opportunity again. I appreciate it. Thank you to my team. Love you guys. And uh, it's a little bit of the curtain pulled back. Thank you.